Good afternoon or good morning. My name is Michelle Whitstone. Tatna Sahni Nishligo Nasht El Tachini Bashishin Ashihid Ashiche Dotro de Conjudashinale. I am the ELA Catalyst here at Eagle View Middle School. And I prepared this um, beforehand. So if some of you were unable to attend our PD, um, I thought it would be nice for you to have one that's pre recorded. So before we begin, I would like us to use the Cognitive Content Dictionary activity. And the Cognitive Content Dictionary is a visual and perceptive way to learn new words or concepts. It applies to everyone. And it's always nice to have something on hand to record learning, to begin writing, to put pencil to paper, and just to um, instigate prior knowledge. So for us teachers, um, what I'd like you to do, I've already created a few pages with some concepts and phrases and words. So if you could go through those pages and circle the ones that are new or um, uh, that you have never heard of before. And uh, please write in your predictions for what they might mean before we begin. So it's about five minutes. You can pause the video to fill that part out before we continue. So the differentiated approaches, learning approaches for our PD today um, will be the following. We will use experiential learning, which is learned by doing through cooperative learning, for instance. Sensory learning, when you learn through touch, see, feel, and also reflecting. We will learn through exploring the content Cognitive content dictionary being one of them to kind of help us with the common language around Nelson literacy. And then exploring resources uh, using cognitive mapping, which is a graphic organizer that could be pre made, or you could start from scratch, which is what we're going to do today. And co planning using shared experience. So what form of planning might be most helpful in keeping track of time, learning, and assessments? How would you map planning? Is copying and highlighting enough? Components of Nelson Literacy. So at this point, we're going to do our scavenger hunt. And I have already made a list of things to find, and I'll leave this up. So go to that page and do your scavenger hunt. You have your Nelson literacy um, bundle in front of you. But if you don't bring yours, if you didn't bring yours, you can use somebody else's who's brought, you know, work with them. Um, and find these things. And I've also added a blank sheet so that you can add other things you've found that you think, you know, you want to share. So thanks to Ms. Semchuk at TSEC to um, for sharing this list. She's helped to inform our PD today. Thank you, Lynn. The instructional framework for grade six is here. And as you can see, there are different top, uh, subject areas all the way across. And for grade six, there are 12 units so you have a plethora of topics to choose from. And the components um, on the side here, you have oral language reading, text patterns and features, word study, writing, and media literacy. And across the top, you have your interdisciplinary components, literature, science, social studies, and health. So that's one of the you know, strengths of Nelson Literacy is the interdisciplinary components in there. And right traits, as you know, is integrated as well. Here is the grade seven. There are six units for grade seven. And the components are down the side, oral language, reading, text pattern, features and forms, elements of style, language conventions. 
writing, media literacy, and transferring your learning. Again, that interdisciplinary component, geography, math, science, health, history, the arts. So, and here is the eighth grade instructional framework. You have six uh, units and you have the same components down the side and the interdisciplinary components as well. And here is um, something that comes off of, a, it's a Heidemann resource and it's a, uh, off the back of a prompt book. And it shows us the three kind of categories of these systems of strategic actions is what they call it, thinking about the text, thinking within the text and thinking beyond the text. So if you look at these components and read through them, um, I can make uh, a copy for you that's a little more clear so you can have it for your own, for your own records. But Nelson literacy in essence is mostly teacher led through shared and guided learning. Uh, and these are, you know, meant to facilitate the independent reading skills and thinking skills. So thinking about text is mainly discussing the design, layout, and the way the author crafted the content, such as the illustrations, text features, and the text itself. And thinking within the text is about self-monitoring from decoding to creating meaning to finding the important pieces that pushes us to create meaning from what we read. So it informs us in different ways. Thinking beyond text is mostly about predicting, making text to text connections, text to self, text to world connections as well, like taking the teachings to think on our own lives and to think also on the author's purpose. So here are some updated views of balanced liter literacy. Balanced literacy is inherent in Nelson literacy. And balanced literacy uses a gradual release of responsibility approach through modeled learning, shared learning, guided learning, and independent learning. Gradual release of responsibility allows the teacher to have and take um, kind of weaning themselves away from the ownership of learning. So they are transferring ownership of learning from modeling to the student where they're independent learners. Balanced literacy informs explicit instructional approaches and assessment strategies. Balanced literacy should acknowledge the needs of learners to grow their spirit, in other words. Engagement is key. The old idea of leveled learning gears us into leveled living, which may have repercussions for social stigma, the hierarchical structure. And balanced literacy supports students in choosing texts based on interests and supports those interests. So here's the whole enchilada. This is the whole bundle. We may not have all the pieces, but we do have these pieces and they're shareable, which is, you know, which pushes us to collaborate. So here on the far right, you have the student booklets and on their spine, you'll see like 6A and then 6B, 6C, so according to grade level. And then you have the guided reading box and these are what the texts look like. They're, they look like uh, cafe menus, uh, restaurant menus. And, um, and there are tabs there to show you. And there's also a teacher resource book that goes with this box. So it tells you what level it is. And the, le the lesson plans are already written. The words to know are already written. And it usually follows the BDA format, which is before, during, and after. And here towards the left, you have the teacher binder and the teacher resource booklets. So you have about maybe 11, 12, or 13 of these. And each is dedicated to each unit within the, the, the grade level 
uh, Nelson Literacy Bundle that you have. And here in the front is the media pack. Um, so the content on CDs that you can put into your, um, into your desktop uh, PC or your laptop to download and print from there and share content in case you need virtual learning or take home booklets. The teacher binder has the introductory lessons. It has the modeled and shared learning resources. So there are uh, pieces that might be missing. Please collaborate to um, kind of help each other out there. Please review contents before you begin a new unit and highlight some great stopping points and copy as needed. The teacher resource booklets, uh, they describe in depth what you will need to prepare ahead of time. So has recommended stopping points, pick and choose which, we, which you're going to use because they list a whole bunch of stopping points and you don't have time to stop at each stopping point. So copy the responsive learning pages that you need beforehand, differentiate as needed. For example, using alternative GOs or graphic organizers. Student booklets and media pack. So each booklet is labeled on the spine, like I said, um, 6A, 6B, 6C as per grade level. The cover of the student booklet shows which units it correlates with. So the media pack again has a text for each unit and also has the black line masters. You can print from the disc and use it for take home reading. The guided reading box has cross-curricular content as, does the, as do the texts that are in, in all the other components. So the guided reading uh, content has diverse content, which appeals to varied student interests. They are very short selections, ideal for guided reading. Wide range of levels from well below grade level to beyond grade level. Links directly to your science, social studies and health curricula and highly visual design hooks even your most reluctant readers. So the selections are printed on sturdy cardstock and laminated so students can use a dry erase marker to underline and circle keywords and ideas. Oops. So Nelson Literacy uses data-driven instructional approaches. Nelson Literacy uses explicit instruction that is responsive. Nelson Literacy uses differentiated and cross-curricular approaches to learning facilitates sense of urgency for learners and teachers, requires small group learning and instruction, requires collaborated effort to meet students' needs. These are all recommendations, but I'm putting requires because we need to collaborate for our students. Uh, studies show that collaborated effort creates more change where change is needed. So the data-driven instructional approaches should, if we handle things with efficiency and diligence, our numbers should reflect the effort we put into learning. Differentiation as responsive teaching. First things first, you need to learn, the learning, learn about the learning styles. How do you know what your students need? The interests, what do they love? So all these are engaging tools. Choices, do they need other ways of showing their learning? Just because they don't talk doesn't mean they aren't listening and learning. And modifications, can you focus, can they focus or concentrate? What are their needs for learning spaces? What can help them achieve learning outcomes? And finally, an example of a misinterpretation is this that I commonly hear. They can't do, so they need only do very little. Actually, the opposite is true. They need more. They need a lot more. More exposure to text. They need more opportunities. 
they need more ways for us. We need to think outside the box. So they're, they're challenging us to think outside the box in responsive teaching. So responsive intervention strategies um, for older struggling readers. So this is Linda Farrell. Um, she's a founding partner at Readsters in Alexandria, Virginia. She works with schools to help design and implement effective reading instruction in all grades. Linda was an English teacher in the late 1970s. However, it wasn't until 15 years later that she learned to teach struggling readers. That happened when she was an investment banker and volunteer to teach adults to read. Through her experiences teaching adults to read, Linda realized that most older struggling readers need explicit phonemic awareness, phonics, and vocabulary instruction at the most basic levels. In 2000, she left investment banking to pursue her mission, which is for all children to learn to read in the early grades. So what is responsive teaching? Responsive teaching, according to Fontes and Pinnell, effective teaching requires your ability to observe your students and then turn your instruction in the direction your readers or writers take you, even if it wasn't planned. This is called responsive teaching. And the link there is where I retrieve that so you can find more information there. So responsive intervention. What is responsive intervention? So if you copy this link here, it will take you to this video where Linda Farrell works one-on-one -on -one with this young learner. And it is a 14 minute video and you can watch it on your own time. And um, using an inquiry approach here, here are some questions to kind of help you to notice some important things in the video. What manipulatives is she using? What are her approaches? Is this tier one, tier two, or three, tier three approach? Is she, how is she differentiating? And where is she sitting? And what kind of materials is she, is she using, right? What does learner need to know already? What does the learner need to know already? What needs to be in their prior knowledge or what needs to be in their knowledge base in order to do this with her? And finally, what are the steps the learner goes through to be able to answer? So kind of thinking about her, what is she visualizing? What is she thinking about as she's listening to Linda asking her these questions and using the manipulatives, how is she making sense of what she's, she's being asked to do? So that kind of goes back to what do they already need to know, right? <clears throat> and there's a link at the bottom there where you can find more videos on reading interventions for tier two and tier three, which I'll explain in a bit. What is culturally responsive teaching or CRP? CRP is culturally responsive pedagogy. Uh, pedagogy is um, in, the, in the area of learning, how learning happens, that's pedagogy. So CRP is acknowledging and activating learners' prior knowledge as a way of engaging them in their learning, which is considering what each is bringing to the table and considering and acknowledging their schemata. So each of our students can contribute to learning by sharing their unique experiences. Some have gone camping, hunting, berry picking, canoeing, so that sensory learning is in their schema, is in their memory base. They know what it feels like, sounds like, how it felt to be in that, in that context. So, and the link at the bottom is a video of a young lady um, who is an expert uh, educator talking about culturally responsive teaching. And it is a short four or five minute video. What is response to intervention? So response to intervention or RTI is a process used by educators to help students who are struggling with a skill or a lesson. 
every teacher will use interventions. Let me repeat that. Every teacher will use interventions, a set of teaching procedures with any student to help them succeed in the classroom. It's not just for children with special needs or a learning disability. This is a quote that I retrieved from that link. So RTI has the tiered learning kind of design or framework. So you have tier one, tier two, tier three, and at the bottom is kind of what is evident or you know, some essential components that we need across the board. So tier one is whole class. It's inclusive, differentiated. You have model shared learning, which is very heavy in tier one. So teacher is modeling think aloud, is showing text, is highlighting, is circling, is doing it you know, vocabulary study or using the cognitive content dictionary to engage the learners into, you know, with the words that they need to know. And tier one is mostly informed by school-wide assessments. So if they're approaching grade level or at grade level or exceeding grade level, then school-wide school assessments usually is enough to kind of, you know, the numbers match the effort, right? So tier two are for smaller groups. Um, again, inclusive, differentiated, and is guided learning, so smaller groups. Um, the rule of thumb is the, the, um, the lower the student in terms of whatever content you're teaching, whether it be literacy, math, or any other subject area, that there be fewer students um, to the teacher, so two students or three students at the most. And then for the more independent learners, you can have four or five or even six. So in tier two, the assessments, um, uh, they're informed by small group uh, anecdotal notes and running records they can inform in the area of literacy that is. And then for tier three, which is even smaller and even one-to-one, uh, where most students could have an IEP. Um, they have modified needs, um, but it doesn't have to be that as well. Like an independent learner could use two or three instructional approach to help them to maybe get better at writing summaries, right? And so different um, uh, leveled students can come together and learn about how to write a stronger summary. So it's not necessarily that they have IEPs, it's that they need uh, differentiated um, modified needs. So maybe there's another way that they can understand that in order to write a summary, this is what they need to learn how to do first. So that structured explicit instruction helps them to understand how to write a summary. So that when they're when they you know they're independent readers, but they are having a hard time writing a summary, right? So, and the assessment at tier three level is informed through more persistent monitoring and screening, which is done to inform the intervention resources or the intervention practices, and the frequency, right? And I have added um, a stethoscope up in the far upper right corner to kind of show that, you know, we're like doctors in a way. Um, we infer what uh, our learners needs are and we try to give them what they need. And we also have to determine how much they need and how often, right? So it's kind of like taking medication uh, for an ailment and, you know, doctor says, take this much, one pill, two pills, however many grams, and this, you know, every two days, you know, twice a day, whatever. So it's kind of like that. And at the bottom here, we have the responsive teaching approaches, ELL informed, English language learner informed, graphic organizers, anchor charts, sensory and experiential learning to engage and culturally relevant to learners. So way of knowing, these are engaging components in each tier. RTI response to intervention. 
So this is something that I got off the internet. Those who are highly qualified in special education are perceptive of culture, cultural and linguistic differences. And they teach curriculum and use RTI interventions that have been researched for their effectiveness, such as small groups, graphic organizers, metaphors, summarizing, scaffolding instruction, and cooperative learning. They monitor student response to RTI interventions and bring data to the RTI team so that timely decisions can be made. So this sort of corroborates what I just explained previously. And the link here at the bottom shares more intervention strategies. Um, okay, so what do we know about our students? So what we know is going to directly affect how we design optimal learning opportunities. First and foremost is the DR2, DRA2 data that we all use and um, the basic groups that we you know, use for guided reading um, and then the range of levels that they have so you're not just going to use the one level because, you know, depends on how fast they move, um, you know, they get, they get at, at reading and you're going to have to adjust. So that's the, the responsive teaching part of it. The better you know your students, the sooner you can do dynamic grouping, which is what I explained earlier, which is grouping for explicit needs that uh, are shared among different students. Um, coming from, uh, you know, their, their strengths and their weaknesses um, that they all share. So you're grouping them not only because they're in a leveled group, you are grouping them according to their needs. So to begin our guided reading, we can do our guided reading um, using a range of levels within each group. And then as you meet with them and get to know them, you're going to be adjusting groups and you're going to be using dynamic grouping as well. So you'll be taking students from different groups for whatever specific needs they all share. So they don't see themselves as, you know, I'm in the low group or you're in the high group or I am in the middle group. You know, they don't, they don't um, use that hierarchical kind of social stigma to place themselves in among their peers. We want them all to know that we acknowledge, you know, the brilliance that they bring to the table. So, and the baseline assessments further inform um, what you know about them, the writing that you, you know, do with them, whether you have a morning journal writing, uh, whether you have a prompt, maybe um, class participation notes, uh, anecdotal notes, QM file information, IEPs if they have one, and other performance samples from what you've already done so far. So here is an opportunity for us to do some grade level discussion and collaboration. So what we're going to use is the cognitive mapping. It is a cooperative learning method which you can use with your students. So there are two separate ways to do this and also other ways, your own way. And um, so what I'd like you to do is to please sit with your grade level peers and choose which unit you're going to begin with. Uh, because we do have limited amount of student booklets. So you don't want them too many of you to overlap so that, you know, there's a shortage of booklets. We don't want that. So Decide on which unit you want to begin with and make sure you have enough student booklets for your unit. Uh, we need to check to make sure. And then to make a cognitive map on 11 by 17 paper, you draw out your journey from beginning to end and figure out the approximate timeframes for each component. So you can use cluster method like webbing on the right hand side, or you can use the linear method where you have a start and then you have a completion. So just kind of do that cognitive mapping. And then along the way also to decide, you know, which assessment Black Line Masters you will use, identify the page numbers and all. So it's going to be messy. It's not going to be perfect. If you want to color it, go right ahead. And um, if you want to do one, for kind of um, 
uh, a general one for the whole grade level, or all of you want to do cognitive mapping for one teacher, that's fine. If you want to do your own, that's fine too. So how do we acknowledge our ways of knowing and being? So it's time to reflect. I'd like you to turn and talk and pick one of these questions to, to think about and with the partner that, that you decide to talk to. So the questions are, can you identify places where you can replace texts with more culturally relevant texts? You can absolutely do that. Can you create a classroom display so students can touch, feel, explore things related to the unit you're about to begin? Which rubrics can you modify or revise with your students? That's engagement and also a way for the students to feel that ownership, right? They contributed, so they're going to be engaged. And how can our learners have ownership of their learning progress to become responsible, independent learners? One immediate way of, of uh, monitoring that is ca the CAFE method with daily five. And I do have the resources to help you set up a bulletin if you want to start there. And then they can, you know, we can wean them off of that so they can choose what they want to work on for the week, for the day, for the month, or, you know, it's ownership on their part. And finally, how can we celebrate our learning? What can we do? In what ways can we say, yes, we finished this unit? Or yes, we, you know, you guys did a really wonderful job with participation. Here's how I want to reward that. So there's the idea of extrinsic and intrinsic motivation and uh, your students and yourself can, can decide on those. So we'll leave this up for as long as we need to and, um, or pause this video and think about reflecting on one, or you can reflect on, reflect on all of them. So our self-assessment for today, how did we do today? So we were saying these were the approaches and methods we were gonna use. So do we feel like we've learned through these approaches? Experiential learn, we learn by doing, corroborative learning. Sensory learning, we saw, touch, felt the material, Nelson Literacy Bundle, and using reflection. We explored common language using the Cognitive Content Dictionary. So you might want to add more um, concepts to that, uh, something you found that you're still questioned about, right? Exploring resources through that cognitive mapping. So when you drew out your, the journey that you and your students are gonna take, what were the components come popping up? What were you know, the questions as you went along? How can I do this part? Um, what am I gonna do here? You know, like That's what grade level meetings are for. And finally, we were co-planning using shared experiences. So we have teachers here who have used Nelson Literacy before, and they can share their units with you, which can be modified. And um, we all have our own preference form of planning that is most helpful, you know, in, in helping us to keep track of time, keeping track of the learning that's taking place, and keeping track of the most useful assessments that can help um, our students to, you know, think about their thinking and also to see their progress. And how would you map the planning? Uh, do you think copying, highlighting is enough? If it isn't, then come see me. We can co-plan. You can co-plan with your peers or you can exchange unit plans with each other so you're not starting anything from scratch, okay? And I believe that concludes this. So there's my contact information. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to shoot me an email or text and uh, let me know how I can be of help. Thank you so much.